ashes The spirits light up the night Looking down the edge of forever So stop me or take my advice Now, from the Untold Radio Network It's Untold Radio AM With Doug and Alex Hijack Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> so today we have um, a house full of um, Bigfoot witnesses, huge camera crew. Um, they've transformed my lower level into a giant studio. So anyhow, it's kind of fun. Sounds uh, wild. And we just got done eating. Um, we had Kane's chicken brought in. Mm, the best. Commercial. Kane's chicken was good. <laughs> yeah. No, it was really good. So I'm full. I'm fed. I never, I'm always starving when I do the show. And I eat afterwards. But this time, I'm pretty fed. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd be worried I'd fall asleep. Yeah, well, it could happen, especially eating uh, chicken with tryptophan in it. You know, the sleepy, <laughs> exactly. The sleepy chemical. But hello, everybody in chat. Um, we didn't do our normal marketing things this week because it's just been hectic, like so many things to do. It's going to be hectic until I found out, and we're not done even Saturday. We're still shooting. Yeah, it sounds like a huge shoot. A yeah, lot of it is. Pieces. Well, there's four huge cameras set up now. Um, two, we've set up two studios, four big cameras. Um, uh, I could have Scott. He, there's still, I mean, there's still a lot of people there. I could have Scott send me a photo if anybody's interested in what we're doing down there. But I, of course, do you think I can? Find Scott's. I know somebody Scott's. Scott this, Scott that, Scott that. And where was Scott on tonight, by the way? Exactly. My cousin, by the way, this guy, this, Scott Angove, is my cousin. And I had my first Class B Bigfoot experience while with Scott. Oh, that's exciting. I we didn't... were deer hunting back in the days when I deer hunted. We were in the uh, northern Minnesota, but anyhow, so he's got all sorts of stories, um, and he um, also owned a big, huge resort up in the wilds of Ontario. Wow! And then some things happen up there that he'll tell us and confess. But before that, we're going to have Mark DeWorth on, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Bigfoot, um, the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. May 5th, right? He's the uh, one of the organizers or the organizer. But we're going to also, he's going to tell us some stinky stories. Love it. Stories of, you know, the stink, because that's kind of what happened to me and Scott. So tonight's theme is the stink. <laughs> I hope the show doesn't stink. Hopefully. Hopefully not. I, I doubt oh. that. And then we're going to, of course, we're going to get into a little, get into a little news. Kind of went light on everything tonight, light on everything, um, because we've got these two great guests. But I um, um, will do technological breakdown tonight. Awesome. And we're going to cover, listen to this, micro thermal cameras. Whoa. Micro. Now start thinking about all the cool stuff you can do if you're a researcher with a really tiny thermal camera. So we'll be re reviewing that. And uh, what else? Let's get started here. Um, so let's see here. I will be, oh, before we get started, I got to tell you about a weird experience I had, right, at my workshop. So 
Do you remember um, we had a guest on? I God, I can't remember who it was, but we were discussing ghosts. Oh, I remember it was um, Patty, I believe. Patty, right? It was like three weeks back. We we're talking about ghosts, and I said, "Well, like I've never had my dad try to contact me, or I've never had, you know, because we were so close." It was kind of surprised me. I figured I'd get a sign, right? Yeah. So I get in. So I said, I said that out loud, right? And then I was thinking it all week. So I get this alarm. This happened um, uh, the night before last. I get a thing where it said it didn't. It was an alarm, but it said there is movement in your workshop. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's kind of weird because that's never happened. It's been years since I've had this system in. It's an AI alarm system and i have it's on the you know it's on the doors it's it's they're just you know you'd have to be a cat burglar to get in there i'll be knowing about it but i i get this notification i'm watching the cameras right Mm -hmm. i don't see anything but i do hear a little bit of noise but the other alarm systems have never been set off so i'm like well there just can't be anybody in there. So I just keep watching the the the, the cameras. I'm watching kind of the corner of my eye while I'm working. Never see anything. Finally, I shut the cameras off. I go there yesterday. In my dad's car, the door was wide open. Wide open. On his car, yeah. That I've restored. Yeah. Whoa. Wide open. And I just got chills. I haven't opened that car door and probably, you know, it's been a long time. Let's put it that way. That is so But weird. it was, you could say, well, that's a coincidence. Maybe yeah. I'll open the door, somebody opened the door. But the fact that the night before I got the, the thing, because it literally, it has to spot something before it can lock onto it. Yeah. And then does. report there's movement. And I have it only set up for people. I don't want a bug or a moth that gets in to set off my camera system. Yeah, yeah, you don't want you that. I literally set them for, you know, I'm literally pominins. You can set it up for cats, dogs, whatever, whatever. But it's just set up for humans. That's it. So, you know, just thought I'd mention it. So maybe that was uh, my dad. That's fine. Yeah. There. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I was asking for a sign. I'm like, yeah, just, you know, let me know you're okay, you know, and everything's chill. <laughs> Whoa. Anyhow, all right, moving on. So I sent you a clip, and I just thought this was, this could have went in my clips, favorite clips, but instead I wanted to talk about it because, man, this kid, I would have not been this cool. And it's video 1A. Can you play that? Yeah, I'll bring it up. And then uh, just want to let you know, just so you know, uh, Mark is in the back room ready oh, okay, to go right. once yeah, we're uh, bring Mark up soon here. through this. Um, here's the clip. You okay, so it? let me explain. Let me set this up. So basically, this is in India. And a leopard just strolls right in. A wild leopard strolls right into a shop. And the way this kid reacts is just genius. The kid is calm. He looks like he's playing video games, right? Yeah. What is that? One of those little iPad things? Yeah. Or not iPad. What are those called? A little game? Nintendo, a little Nintendo, Nintendo Switch or something. Yeah, something like that. Okay. So he's playing that. Go ahead and play it now. Watch. Just watch what this kid does. It's amazing to me. Totally pulls an Abbott and Costello on this uh, leopard. No panic, no nothing. Cat turns his back and he just goes <laughs> out the door. I love it. Okay. <laughs> that's a brilliant kid. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's smooth. I don't know what I would have just, I don't know what I would have I would have panicked. I would have panicked too. Yeah. That's leopards are really, mm, they can be aggressive. Um, apparently, I think it was yesterday or the day before, but four astronauts returned from four different countries back to Earth after being in a, in a small uh, orbit for six months. 
Think about being in a capsule for six months. No, not that. Alex is getting ahead of me. Yeah, Alex does. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't have any picture for this. There is no picture. I, I thought it was the picture. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I'm getting to that one, but that's okay. So these guys are in this capsule for six months orbiting Earth. Think about that. You know how small those things are? Yeah, tiny. Okay. Then, then I'm, I'm reading the article, I'm reading the article, and it says basically they caught a they caught a ride with SpaceX to come back home, a lift. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I wonder what Elon charged per mile Ooh. for that Uber lift, right? Yeah. What do you think? Take a guess. What do you think it cost per mile? Please leave in the comments, research it out. What did SpaceX charge the U.S. government? To bring these astronauts home. Oh, I I'm just sure wonder. it was millions. I don't millions. know. I, I really don't know. 20 million. I just wonder, what does it cost per million. mile? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what an Uber costs? Hey, that's expensive. <laughs> this is from space. But anyhow, it says here, um, before they left the space station, these guys, being gone for six months, he said that, that one of the guys, um, uh, Mogensen, Said on Twitter that he couldn't wait to hear the birds singing in, the, in you know in the trees, and he craved crunchy food. Why <laughs> wouldn't they have crunchy food up on the on the uh, space station? That's a good question. Why not crunchy? Would be are they worried about crumbs? Yeah, maybe, maybe getting into the. The other thing I wonder, you know, when they came down and they splashed down in Florida, is that space capsule still really hot? It's got to be right. I don't know. Does it sizzle when it hits the, the cold ocean? Splash down in Florida. I just wonder. Somebody can look that up. I don't know. I'm curious. What's the temp of the capsule when it hits the water? You know, upon reentry, huh? 300. And if, it, and if SpaceX brought it home, why did it have to do a splash down? That's the other thing I don't get. So they gave it a ride back, but then they, what are they just like? bring them over the ocean and say goodbye and release them and let them drop on a parachute? What's the deal? I don't know. I don't know. It's okay, weird. now you can put up the other picture. This is weird, too. It's a weird story. This is a pallet of garbage batteries that they just bailed out of the space station. Weighs 10,000 pounds. A pallet. Of batteries, old batteries. They just toss it out. Well, what do you think is going to happen? So eventually, it comes into the the atmosphere, tumbles out of control, and makes a uh, out of it makes an out of control re you know reentry. Re yeah. yeah. But listen to this. So it says, um, <clears throat> one, um, they figure there's a one in ten thousand. Chance of having a casualty because they're dropping a ten thousand pound thing on somebody or on the Earth. Ouch! One in ten thousand, and they said that that is um, okay. So on Friday, March eighth, a pallet of used batteries from the International Space Station re-entered Earth atmosphere over the Gulf of Mexico, following an unpredictable journey through and orbit. Okay. The pallet contained nine batteries and weighed 2.9 tons. That's what it was. <laughs> so was there 2,000 pounds in a ton? So it's like 5,000 pounds, basically, right? That's brutal. No, they just says it. they tossed it by the uh, Canada, Can Canada arm, the robotic arm. So it's been tumbling towards Earth uncontrolled, but they said and it landed somewhere around Cuba or Cancun. They didn't even know. Um, uh, and it said there were old nickel hydrogen batteries, and they want to replace them with new lithium ion batteries. And said there's they 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 find the space agencies calculate that they all commonly accept 
a 1 in 10,000 probability threshold for a casualty risk, okay, of a single uncontrolled reentry, according to the ESA. <clears throat> and I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine you or I doing that? Just taking a whole pallet of two, you know, almost three tons of batteries and just whipping them out the window? What the heck? I just, yeah, that's crazy if you think about it. Okay, and that's it for any news. I'm not covering much news. Um, clip one, I want to just play it really quick. Sound is fine. So it's spring, right? So if you want to really give your kids a thrill, you don't go buy one of those little bubble, you know, the little bubble things that you blow. You know, Alex? Yeah. You went through a million of them when you were a kid, and you dip it, and you blow. Get a big string. You can just do this with a string in your hands, too, because we've done it. But this guy's just taking a big string, and he's separated on a pole, and he dips it in some soapy water, and watch what it does. You can do this with string, people. I really give your kids a thrill. We got to play it, Alex. There we go. It's moving. I'm sure people have done this in the audience. Whoa, that's massive. Yeah, you can make some really huge bubbles. If you get the right light, light breeze day, it really helps. A giant tunnel. Autumn Williams was doing this in our yard one time for my kids. She was making <laughs> these huge, and it was pretty mean. She just grabbed a string and did it. It's the first time I saw it done. That's awesome. Making these seen massive like... bubbles. Okay, that's enough of that. Clip two <clears throat> is sound is good. It's a super, really weird creature I want to show. Right? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, clip two is the same link as the first one. Something um. No. Uh, I know. Oh my god! That's because I had twenty people who were standing around. Okay. I, I I know. know. I crazy. screwed up. That's all right. Well, clip three will not disappoint. Sound is good. It's a huge squid and a little tiny boat. This is not the thing to be on in. The Sea of Cortez, this little thing here. Just watch. Oh, my gosh. And these humble squid are really aggressive, right? What is he doing? And his girl, you, you can put the sound up. You know, you know the sound on. His girlfriend's laughing. <laughs> How come there's no sound? You can't hear the sound? No. Yeah. Well, play it. That's fine. Just play it. Don't worry about it. Let it play. Okay. Anyhow, just watch. It's a little hairy here. These things have hooks, right? They have these really razor sharp hooks on there, and each sucker's got a big hook. And these things will drag you down. That squid's big enough just to drag him down into the abyss. You see its tentacles up there? Yeah. If one of those tentacles gets a hold of him, he's goner. He's going to get sucked down. Anyhow. Yikes. But it was just funny. His girlfriend was laughing at him. It's like, no. No, don't laugh. <laughs> don't do that. All right. All right, let's bring Mark on. And, and I'm going to introduce him, but then we'll do technological breakdown with Mark with us, right? Yeah. Perfect. Hopefully Mark's not in a big rush to go home tonight. Um, but um, I want to introduce Mark real quick. And I wrote up something. So so Mark is a man who lives in Ohio, right? But he does two really cool things. One, he searches for giant trees. Love it. How many people do you know does that? Professionally, right? Uh, I know one now. Measure him. And he might maybe he's got some photos he can share. But um, and I know he's had articles written about him because he he finds these giant trees. I mean, they really are giant, right? massive. So apparently, this group that he works with has um, discovered more than a thousand of the state's largest trees. 
And then, of course, he's a Bigfoot researcher, and he puts on the Ohio Bigfoot, you know, organizes the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. So it's and does research and blah, blah, blah. Perfect combo, right? Yes. So I'm going to see Mark in May. Let's bring him on. Hey, Mark. How's it? Hey, how's Here it going? Goes. Tell us about these giant trees real quick. Oh, it's just a passion of mine that's turned into a career. And I go around the state of Ohio looking for the largest trees of, of all the native species that I can find and document them for the state. Wow. And, uh, um, it's just fantastic. And if you look, see if, you can, if I can get it right. <laughs> look at this thing right. Oh, yeah, I can see I'm it trying, hanging up there. There's a giant one right there. But, uh, yeah. um, but no, it's just something that I'm passionate about. And I... I love nature. I love being in the woods. I love exploring and seeking and finding. So kind of like with Bigfoot, finding big trees are kind of like the same thing. And I always think that, hey, maybe one day when I'm looking at a big tree, a Bigfoot will step out behind it. Good right. It's a good combo. It's a perfect combo. Yes, exactly. <laughs> perfect exactly. combo. Okay, well, let's just pitch. Let's tell everybody about the conference just real quick. Then we're going to talk about Bigfoot. Um it's May 5th, correct? Starts May 4th. May 4th, see? Yes, May the well, 4th. Well, I'm speaking be with on you. the 5th. So, you know, you'll be speaking on the 4th, which is Saturday. Oh, geez. Oh, it's geez. okay. Well, you'll figure it out. Yeah, I'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, uh, May 4th. Yeah, May, May 4th, Salt Fork State Park Lodge and Conference Center in yeah. Cambridge, Ohio, which is in Guernsey County. Um, it's a th- pretty much a three day event Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All sorts of activities planned throughout the entire weekend. On Friday, we have we have a, a free to the public hike at 11 a.m. where you meet at the lodge in the front front parking lot at the lodge, and it's taken somewhere within the park of an area that's had historical Bigfoot activity and or sightings in the area. And uh, and then Friday evening, we usually have like a meet and greet dinner at the lodge at the lodge host that you can get tickets for that just by calling the lodge and. Uh, um, and of course, you guys will be there and everything like that. And then on Saturday will be the conference all day, lectures, gigantic flea market, vendors on three levels, food trucks outside, chainsaw carvers, just about everything and anything you could imagine in Bigfoot's cryptids, any any misfit freaks of, of cryptids that you can think or even probably UFO alien stuff, I'm sure will be there. And uh, just like I say, it's just a great time. It's a a sea of humanity of all Bigfoot encrypted people. So it's a great oh. time. That sounds like quite a, quite a thing. Is it, is it the like biggest conference in the country or no? You know, I mean, just put it this way. It sells out quicker than anything. It, it's the, the tickets for the event typically sell out in, you know, under five minutes when they go on sale. And uh, so it's kind of like, you know, trying to get tickets to say, you know, a Led Zeppelin concert or something or, or something like that. When they go on sale, they're gone instantly. And uh, <clears throat> um, so it pretty much, uh, you know, if I had a bigger venue, I could sell more tickets. That wouldn't be a problem. But that's yeah. not what it's all about. It's about uh, being at Salt Fork, being in an area that has historical significance in the Bigfoot yeah. world. And uh, so that when people come there and visit from all over the country and even out of the country, they get to experience Ohio's Bigfoot country at its best. Yeah, cool. Yeah, um, somebody said, uh, Kevin Morrison said, Mark runs the best and biggest conference. So there you go. Uh, so there you go. I don't know. You, I have you like them big, Mark. I, yeah, yeah, you like them big. <laughs> yep, indeed. Everything's big with Mark. Okay, anyhow. Change the subject. Let's uh, <laughs> um, let's see. What we, no, 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 no. Okay. So, um, one, are there still like current sightings still happening at Salt Fork in that area? You know, there's there's sightings all throughout the state, and yes, there have been sightings in and around that vicinity of of Guernsey County. But I mean, it's all over the state. I mean, in all different sections. I mean. I think with Salt Fork, uh, yeah, there's a sighting here and there every so often, but it's I don't think it's as much as people think it is. 
or they want to think it is. I think more than anything, the sightings are in the more remote sections of the park and maybe just outside the park and the in the very, very rural areas that a lot of far, old farmland, places like that. And, uh, um, but yeah, there, I mean, there's activity, but like I say, you got to take it with a grain of salt because it's salt fork and so many people go there and in, in research. So sometimes it dilutes the quality of the information. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we'll, uh, I know I've been there. Our, my crew was just there recently. Um, and then now me and Alex are coming. So, and then we're going to be coming back to Salt Fork area, northeastern Ohio, in May. So, things happen in threes. See, there you go. Yeah, things happen in threes. So, do you have any cool stories? Because I know you take a lot of stories, right? Oh, and we were we were thinking on it? we were thinking Andre. on on stories that maybe incorporated smell because our next guest, we're going to be telling some stinky stories about Bigfoot. Well, I, I mean, I can think of one in, in particular that comes to my mind, you know, just off the top of my head. It's a matter of fact, I live in L Lorain County, Ohio. Okay. So this just happened one County South of me in Medina County. Um, it was roughly around 10 years ago remember getting a phone call from someone down in Valley City, Ohio, saying, hey, uh, there's someone that I know that, you know, claims that, you know, something very weird happened. It happened the night before and their and their and their daughter was very concerned about it and mentioned that what what it possibly could be. And would you be willing to talk to them? So I'm like, really, Valley City? I said, that's like 12 minutes from my house. So I called my one buddy Coyote up and I said, hey, let's go down and interview this this lady claiming to have some kind of activity at her, at her house. And so Coyote and I, we went down there and met, met the daughter, met the parents, and you know, let, let them tell the story. And apparently the lady, she gets up every morning around four 30 in the morning to feed the cat. So as she's getting, as she gets up and makes her coffee, she has a real typical routine to turn in the coffee pot on with the cats buzzing around her legs, wanting to be fed mm -hmm. and everything like that. And she said she noticed something really, really unusual. And it was that the cats were not like there at her legs. And she thought it was kind of strange that, uh, that the cats weren't there hovering. And, you know, anyone who's a cat owner, I am, they are howling in first thing in the morning, wanting to be fed all over your legs when you're standing there wanting to be fed so she said she just happened to like go out of her little kitchen into her dining room looked over to the right and saw like on the couch in their little living room she saw her three cats were sitting on the edge of the couch just staring out the front window and she couldn't figure out what was wrong with them like why they weren't over there wanting to be fed so she says i go, I go back to the coffee maker and uh, and as I was pouring a cup of coffee, I just happened to look over toward my dining room table to the left. There's a big bay window there. And she goes, when I looked over there, she goes, I noticed because it was a divided window with panes in the middle. And she goes, I, I noticed like something was staring in the window at her. And she goes, at first I'm thinking, what what is this, an optical illusion? And then she realized that the barn light that was be that you could see out the window was being blocked by some silhouette there. And she says she could see just because of the little bit of ambient light in her kitchen, she could see like eyes blinking and eyes shine. And she said, she goes, I got so scared when I saw this. She says, I instead of going toward it, I went to the other side of the out the other side of the kitchen into the front living room and just sat at the couch for a, a few minutes. She goes, I was hoping my husband was about to get up and he would come out and I would say something. She said about five, six minutes goes by and he finally comes out and she goes, honey, honey, come here. She goes, there's a prowler looking in the window. And uh, he goes, what are you talking about? So he, he looks out the, front, the dining room window by the table, doesn't see anything. So he opens up the back door. And when he opens up the back door, this awful, pugent odor just comes pouring in the house. And they both said that, you know, this was definitely not a skunk order. It's, it smelled like rotten flesh, mm -hmm. just the most nastiest smell ever. And uh, and he said that it literally lasted outside 
He walked around with the gun around the house, everything like that. He said for two hours, you could still smell remnants of the smell. Okay, so to make a long story short, it's not that they were thinking it was a Bigfoot. Well, when the daughter found out about it, she said, what window was it looking into? And they pointed, or she, the mother, pointed which window. She goes, Mom, that's kind of strange. That window's pretty high up there. So when we came down, my buddy Coyote, which you'll meet at the conference, he's almost six foot five. So when I'm interviewing the lady in the kitchen, I told him to go outside and look in the window. Well, when he went outside to look in the window, the top of his head wasn't even close to the lower sill of the window. And he had to reach his hand up just to touch the window. And he couldn't even reach up to the center pane where she claimed the eyes were looking in. And uh, so we came to a conclusion, whatever it was, was like eight and a half feet tall. And it was wide enough to block the barn light behind behind the, the the window that you would see if something was was you know if it wasn't being blocked you could see the barn out there and so whatever it was was looking in the window the cats were acting absolutely not normal and obviously it was over eight and a half feet tall off the ground it had glowing eyes and the smell was absolutely horrific well that area of the state yeah once in a while we do get reports from there and 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 the the ironic thing is that right across the street from their property was the Rocky River watershed. So anything big that's going to come in and out of that valley in that area is going to come up that waterway. And so it was literally right across yeah. the, the, the street from the river. So, I mean, those kind of situations happen. And, uh, you know, and I still to this day, I have absolutely pretty no doubt, much doubt what, what, what it was because nothing could be that tall. Nothing could be that wide. Nothing could have glowing eyes other than a Sasquatch that I know. Yeah. Yeah, the fact that there's that corridor, the river corridor, I yep. mean, it could be anywhere as long as there's a river or a stream. Well, so and that's, like, what they typic- that's what they typically do in Ohio uh, is they follow our waterways. Yeah. And uh, since we have so many of them, they have so many choices. And, you know, there's so many bodies of water in our state and probably not as many as Minnesota, but... There are a lot, we have a lot of water and a lot of net lack of natural predators. So it's a perfect area for a Sasquatch to prosper. It was funny because I was talking to um, um, Angie. Um, some people know her as Snow White Big, but we had her on our show. You know, I had asked her a question when we were on the phone. This is after the show. And I said, by the way, does blue mean anything to you? Have you ever gotten any gifting that's, you know, like blue rocks or anything? She says, yeah, that's funny you ask. She Within seconds, she's showing me this blue rock, right? Mm. And I looked at it, and I went, that's it's on that sludge glass that from a steel factory. It's really beautiful blue. Have you ever heard of this kind of glass? You know, yeah, I've, I've heard of the glass, yes. Okay, so it's sludge glass, and so it's from a steel mill. So I said to her, are there any steel mills near there? And she's like, yeah, about 10 miles away or less. So we look on Google Maps. And there's a steel mill, but there's a river that goes from that steel mill right to her property. It literally <laughs> travels. So when you when you get little ding ding dings like that, where everything is like totally, because she had no idea what she just thought it was a really cool rock. She didn't know it was a from the uh, process of making steel. Um, but when she I asked her, the steel mill was there, and then the river. It was right to her property from that steel mill. And I just, you kind of get the hair stand up in the back of your neck, you know, and everything yeah. fits. That's really well, cool. I, I, I had a, a Lorraine County park ranger once told tell me that he got a report at an, on an old non-functional steel plant that was closed and it was gated and fenced in, but it went, the back of the property went up to the, excuse me, went up to the Black River yeah. and, uh, um, and he said that when he heard reports, they said that they thought it was a homeless person coming and going. So what they would do to the back door of the building, they'd put these giant padlocks on. Well, the problem is, so when the Rangers got there, they got there because they said there was some disturbance and they had a security type, like a trip alarm set. So if anyone tried to come in the building, the alarm would go off and the, and the Rangers would be, the Metro Parks would be notified and they would go check it out. And when they went and checked it out, not only was the door open, but it was ripped off the hinges, lock still attached. And uh, he, and of course, the river's in the background. And he says, I, that was the first time I ever thought anything about Bigfoot ever in his life, because he said, 
from the door on the back of the old steel plant, he says there was a clear track line at night. He could see it in his flashlight heading right toward the river. Like it just went right into the river and like swam across or swam away because that river is quite deep in that area. And, uh, you know, maybe it was looking for shelter and maybe it was storing something or maybe it was sleeping in there. It's hard to say. So, uh, um, it's definitely, uh, you know, very interesting. I mean, what, how they take advantage of anything and, you know, things like shiny rocks and things like that, it doesn't, you know, none of this stuff surprises me anymore. I mean, there's just so much, so much claims and so many people claiming different things. So anything's pretty much possible. Somebody, um, somebody just wrote a comment. Oh, uh, Swope. Do you see that, Alex? Yeah, let me read it. It says, the blue rock thing is interesting. I've heard quite a few stories involving blue rocks or glass. Yeah, it's definitely. I just want to let you know that we got Scott in the oh, okay. back room. So he's just ready when you are. Sweet, sweet. Um, yeah, so um, blue kind of see. You know, I bring that up to people. And the reason I bring it up is because I have found so many blue little blue objects in very remote um when i see tree structures these are almost like nest type things you know or, or deer blinds they're quite extensive thousands sometimes they have a thousand sticks woven together and don't know if they're man-made or not but i find it interesting I keep finding one little blue object in them you know i find it's funny because I'm in the woods all the time. I find rocks all the time in weird places. And, uh, and most of the time it's people doing it. Yeah. They're painting them and things like that. Yeah. I mean, but I'm talking in super remote places where people will put a rock with an XOXO or a heart yeah. on it. And oh, here's yeah. me just wandering around looking. It's like, what's that? Oh, whoa, wow. <laughs> and then sometimes they even list like an Instagram account or, you know, something like that. You can tag them. So if you take a photo, it's kind of. Yeah. kind of funny but yeah yeah i mean everything has curiosity and cool looking things so yeah you know it'd Who be knows? good if you had a go ahead no i'm just gonna say it's these are things that are just interesting to look out for oh, you know, of course information yeah. and you can test things by getting information out to see what kind of feedback you get you know there's yeah, been things course. that we've put out where all of a sudden we'll get 100 people contact us and say, yeah, that happened to me. That happened to me. That happened to me. After a while, we'll at least take note of it, right? Keep yeah, of course, out. of course. You have to. You have to have your. You have to have your investigation booklet full of every detail possible yeah. because you yeah. never know something that happened ten years ago that you thought was just a laughing stock might be true today. You just don't yeah. know. That is so true. Um, are you going to hang out, Mark? You want to take off? We're gonna. We're gonna. At some point, what time is it? Some no, it's no rush. But I don't know if you want to hang out, Mark. Or well, how, about wanna... if I get, how about if I give you one more story and then I oh, check out because be awesome. be, because I do I do have a I do have to go to get to bed because I get up or every day at like four o'clock. So and gotcha. uh, yeah, it comes I early. Just, yes, exactly. But uh, um, but you know another story I was thinking about the smell stories. Yes, um, I remember an old old report down in like. Uh, no, oh, I guess it'd be Coshocton County, which is close to Salt Fork. Yeah. Um, and this was an old, you know, I, I think I investigated the report with Don Keating many years ago. And it was a report where, uh, where a lady, she was living at her parents' property in a separate trailer from the parents', the parents' house. And she had a newborn and her husband worked night shift. And so during, during the night, and it was in the warm time of the summer, so they had the windows open on the on the on the trailer. And typically, the windows that open on those trailers open like this; they vent out. Right. Yep. And uh, out. so she, yeah, exactly. So so during the night, the baby was real colicky, crying all night, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and the the mom kept getting up, changing the diaper, trying to get the baby to go back to sleep. And the baby just continued to cry, and she'd go in and out as the night would go on. And she's finally. One, one of the times she walks in and she notices that the trailer has this horrific smell. Well, and she's, so she's, and it's not the baby, you know, taking, a, taking another two, let's just say. And she noticed this smell permeating in the warm summer, summer air. And uh, as she was changing the baby on the baby table, or well, right by the baby table was one of these windows looking out to the side of the trailer. And as she looked up, she sees this thing staring down at her. And so she just picked her baby up and screamed as loud as she could. And when she screamed, 
whatever it was outside scream back. And they both scream so loud that the parents in the house, which was probably 120 feet away, you know, they woke them up to the point, all the lights go on and here comes dad with the gun and everything, you know, looking around like what's going on. And she's freaking out that this something was looking in the window of the trailer and one, so they called the sheriff's department. And when the sheriff's department came out, you know, they, they came out and said it was looking in this window. Well, it was like almost 10 feet off the ground. And so whatever it was, was huge in size. But the cool thing is, is that on the storm door going into the single trailer, they found, this is a long time ago in the early 80s, they found a giant handprint on the window. And I know, oh. I know Don Keating had tried so hard to get a copy of that report, but back then the police did not cooperate at all yeah. when it came to this thing. But it was a, supposed to be a huge handprint. Like what, so whatever it was actually had its hand on the window of the door to go into the place. But, but, you know, and a lot of people, we speculated about it, you know, not only the smell and everything like that, but think about this. If there's a baby crying and crying into the night, you're in the middle of Appalachia, And, you know, you're a lonely female Sasquatch, let's just say, that maybe lost a baby or two over over its life. And you hear this crying. Maybe it was just a mother Bigfoot doing like any other mother would do, coming to see what was wrong. Because it didn't seem like to show any aggression or, you know, other than that, more it was more interested in what the baby or how the baby was doing. So it was kind of an interesting thing. But there was definitely the odor was so noted how the whole place smelled, even when the police came they could the smell was still in the air so so it's you know an interesting situation so don't you don't you think that maybe the window peeker peekers are mainly female bigfoots because of the curiosity with children and well it it could be that or it could be even the adolescent males too the ones that aren't fully sexually mature or just at that age age, you know kind of like teenagers what do teenagers do we screw around we have fun You know, and I always say in the Bigfoot world, it's always the teen or the young males that are told by the big alpha males, okay, I want you to go down to that chicken coop down there, try to get this and this and that, because you're not as big as me and won't be seen as easily. And uh, of course, where the big males just saying, I just don't want to do the work, let you do it for me. And, uh, you know, things like that. So the more mischievous ones are the younger ones. And, you know, they're the ones that get in trouble. But I, I think though, with just, uh, you know, being a parent, you know, especially a woman thing, you know, women, when they hear babies cry, they're concerned. And that would, to me, and I think, I think a Bigfoot as a, as a, as a creature itself is pretty, uh, um, I I think it's pretty gentle. They're very gentle giants. And I think they care about things like that. I truly do. No, it's a good, I mean, it's, it's as as good as um, a theory um, as anything. It really is. I've just in the last week, I keep talking to people who have had window peekers, you know? Yeah, that's, that's common. I mean, you know, from people, even people prepping food at the kitchen window, looking out and there's something staring in. I mean, they're definitely curious on what we're doing. Yeah. Most definitely. And, and, you know, at night when it gets a little bit darker, the window, you know, you don't notice what's outside as much. Um, so they have quite a bit of uh, cover peeking in a window because the inside of the cabin's lit up or the house is lit up, and they're kind of out in the darkness. Um, but they get close enough, and people see them. Yeah. I talked to yeah, one guy exactly. that's had 30. He's had a window peeker 30 times when he was younger, you know, when he was a kid. Well, and and that's a that's a commonality. I mean, we get a lot of stories of when people that are now older adults that they remember when they were a kid, like playing peekaboo, you know, and, and thinking was just fun when really it was, they were playing big peekaboo with a Bigfoot. Yeah. I mean, you know, just like looking in the window. I, I remember actually Northwest Ohio in Ogles County, that's outside of Lima, Ohio, middle of Northwest Ohio, middle of nowhere. And uh, the woman was a wildlife like educator and had a wild animals like she rescued them on her property and she was there doing something on her computer in her office and she had those awning windows on the top of the top of the bedroom windows and she just happened to notice because she had the light off and so the computer screens illuminating her face and she happens to look up at the one window and she sees this creature literally 
face up to the window looking down at her. And it was one of those witnesses where like Sibylla Irwin, who's an artist, Sibylla actually, uh, you know, uh, drew a composite of what she saw of this creature looking in. And uh, so and it was in a remote area of this county. And uh, so it was interesting how it was interesting what she was doing in that office yes. at a wildlife rehab place to, to boot. So it's interesting. <clears throat> and back to the smell what do you think what do you think that is i don't think that they smell like that all the time i think no, it's no, something I, they're I, producing i think i think it's most definitely a fear factor like if you if they get startled by us i think if they get worried by us like for example you know uh, maybe the baby crying in the one situation caused the bigfoot to admit this smell because it was worried it was scared for the mm -hmm. baby or the sound of the crying and uh, and also too, it uses it when oh, as a worn away. If you think about it, you know, if you have a, I always tell people there's a good analogy. You take a skunk, you take a T Rex. A skunk, no matter what, is going to go toward the T Rex, even if the T Rex is trying to eat it. No matter what, the T Rex is going to eat it. But in the end, the skunk's going to win because he's going to skunk the T Rex, and uh, because they don't fear anything, skunks. That's why they get hit on the road during breeding season. They yeah. don't care. I mean, they're just that the, they're going to get one last laugh on you. And I think with the Bigfoots, if they're not aware that we're there, that's when they emit that worn away or that skunk effect. Because as soon as we pick it up to our nose, we freeze in the spot and it gives the Bigfoot long enough time to move farther away. And if you smell something that putrid, you're going to stop in your tracks regardless. It's called common sense. People just are going to freeze. And uh, but it doesn't happen all the time. If the Bigfoots know we're there. They aren't going to be admitting that that smell because they're the ones controlling the whole situation. Yeah, no, it's, no, I agree. I agree with everything you said. I think it's something they're producing. Well, gorillas, gorillas even produce um, yes, smells. They do. People describe it as burnt rubber, rotten flesh, um, sulfur from a gorilla. Well, and a lot of times, two, two, two silverback gorillas, when they, that's kind of their way to avoid fighting. They both emit their stink. And yeah. that's kind of their like, way. This is my area. And then that's your area. And if they have to fight, they do fight. But it isn't too common that they do. But it's that yeah. smell, that pugin odor that this is me and here am I, here am I. So I'm sure it's, you know, something similar to that. Yeah, it probably is. But boy, have you smelt it, Mark? You know, I, there's a couple times over the over the years doing research and some investigations where, yes, I have picked up some odors very quickly, very small doses of it. Nothing where it was a constant odor, but things that definitely weren't right and uh, yeah. definitely startled us. So there'd be group, a few couple groups, maybe two, three of us together. And there were some things that did happen. I didn't see a Bigfoot you know, per se, that maybe could have made it, but where it was in an area that was having current activity, we we're getting a lot of evidence collected from there. So it may have been, I, you know, I can't be a hundred percent certain, but uh, definitely it's part of their culture and their history in terms of people who have having encounters with these things. So, Well, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, oh, my pleasure. Mark, for coming Thanks, on. Mark. I'm going to see you on uh, May 3rd, probably. We're going to be down yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah, down come on down. down. We'll have, yeah, we'll have a good time. Like I say, you're welcome to come as early as Thursday if you want, and uh, um, you know stuff like that. We'll have a blast. That sounds good. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, Mark. And oh, me too. It should be a good time. It should be a great conference this year. Yep, it will so, be. And who are, who are you your speakers? Who are your? I think speakers? I have. I think I have Doug Highcheck. If you know him. Yep. I and do. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, get Dr. <laughs> Jeff Meldrum. Yeah, I know uh, him. Uh, Cliff Berrickman, yep. no, yep, I yep. think uh, uh, Mike Pruitt, I have, and uh, Matt, oh, Pruitt. I, and Matt, Pruitt. Matt, Matt Pruitt, yeah, Matt Pruitt, and and uh, Dr. I think Darby Orcutt. Oh, okay, from, Darby. Uh, there, and, okay. Yeah, Darby will be there, and then I have uh, oh, Adam Davies is going to be the MC, and cool. uh, you know, it's going to be a good time, and there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of people that you know that you know that a lot of people know, different people that have spoken in the past, and it's a lot of good folk there. I mean, the good thing about the OBC is just nice people from all over the country, yeah. and you know, I always say it's kind of like the Woodstock of Bigfoot, so it's just a bunch of fun and we've got lots of education and a lot of people to meet in, and I'm sure you guys will get a ton of stories. So, yeah, I can so, only imagine. Yeah, so, no, yeah I know you, it'll be. 
It'll be mind blowing. I better bring my notebook, so it'll be mind blowing. So, yeah, you better bring the three binder or the three. What do you call it? The three the the multiple three sections. The three. Yeah, but there was a name for it. The three subject notebook. Oh yeah, the three subject. Yeah. Alex, yeah. remember that. Bring the three. Yeah. Get the free notebook. subject notebook. So. <laughs> well, this will be <laughs> Alex's first conference he's ever gone to. Oh wow, that'll so, be cool. I'll take I'll, as a treat. It when we we'll get a little time, I'll take you to go see a few big trees that are close by too, as a treat. So love it, <laughs> Alex. I love yeah. big trees. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Right. So anyways, okay, right. guys. Well, well I appreciate we'll you having see. me on and. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys, and I'll be in touch in the next week. I'll give you a call. Okay, sounds cool. Thanks. Okay, take Over care. Now. See you guys. All See right. you, friends. Bye. 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 Great guy. Are uh, you excited to go? Yeah, can't wait. Yeah. I, I just, it's kind of sucking you into my world. Yes. You're going to meet so many people. And the thing is, people people know you because of the podcast. I know. I'm like a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not really. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it'll, be, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to going with you. I'm sick of going with your brother, Blaine, to all these. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't want Blaine now. So it'll just be me and Alex. So anyhow, is Scott in the back room? Yeah, I am here. I am here. I'm still laughing, guys. Okay. Oh, I thought that was kind of neat. So okay, so we Alan, have Alan, we, we have the one much like you, Doug. He is. <laughs> we have the one and only Scott Angove. Scott lives in northern Minnesota. He is. He was like my favorite cousin growing up. Did a lot of stuff. His dad was absolutely like the greatest sportsman. The nicest guy. He would, if I'd go visit him, he would never let me leave. It's like, oh, stay for another cup of coffee. Oh, stay overnight. Stay this. Stay. <laughs> your dad yep. was awesome. Loved your dad. Yep. So, but yep. me and Scott um, have, you know, we started out kind of life having a, an experience together. And I'm going to let you just talk, Scott. I'm going to shut up. Go ahead. Well, um, it, if, if you're thinking about this uh, situation that uh, we were all deer hunting together, is that what you're thinking about? Yes, sir. Yeah, we uh, we had gotten together with uh, my brother-in-law from uh, Orr, and uh, we went into an area called Long Lake just off the, uh, uh, um, I can't remember the name, exact name of the road, but uh, there was a bunch of us in there. Um, your friend was with you. What was yep. his name? Ron. Ron was with Ron, yeah. Okay, so there was myself and a couple others, and we went into this area, and it was full of deer. It had been slashed, which, in other words, logged off just a couple years mm -hmm. prior to this, so there was a lot of deer in there. And uh, well, I remember, was it my dad that walked you to a stand, showed you where a stand was? Correct. Yep. And, your, your dad uh, put me. Left. Your dad put me on that stand in the pitch darkness. Um, yeah, it morning, was a beautiful yeah. day. Yeah. Yep. And the sun comes up and you go, where am I? <laughs> but uh, exactly. uh, anyway, mm -hmm. I remember, I'll, I'll kind of cut this short. I, you, you probably don't have much time, but um, I remember. We haven't, Scott, back. Scott, we have, we have an hour. Oh, we have a whole hour to talk, Scott. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk until I'm blue in the face. Anyway, um, <laughs> I remember showing up at the truck, all of us to have lunch yeah. and somebody said something about uh, Bigfoot or whatever. The stink. And what's that? Yeah, I think I, I might have mentioned it first. I said, did anybody yeah. else smell something really bad? Okay. All right. So uh, one thing led to an, one, one thing led to another. And, and the more we talked about it, oh boy, you know, I think we just, some of us just had a uh, close encounter or whatever you want to call it. Um, that area has been known for sightings, strange things. Um, you're at the, you're at the South end of Voyagers National Park. You're at the, uh, Arrowhead region that reaches into Canada at a Coquin area and all the way up. I mean, there's just no man's land in there, water all over the place, rivers, creeks, beaver dams, and so on. 
so it, it, it doesn't surprise me, Doug, okay, that, uh, that people have experienced things there. Um, I myself had an experience in that same area within a half mile of where you were. So, yeah. Uh, well, tell us, tell us about your, I tell us what really happened. Know what say, say, say about that, but was that the first time, Doug, was that the moment that got you interested interested in doing what you're doing now? Well, let's put it this way. Okay, so let me tell you the story real Hello? quick again, or tell everybody. So I'm on the yeah, deer stand. Yeah. Dad, your sound's not working for some reason. I don't know if you pulled oh. the cord. Okay. I've got it. He'll he'll be back in just a second here. Okay. Testing. Testing. His sound wasn't working or mine. Uh, your your sound is fine, Scott. It's just Hello? Uh, can't hear. you hear me? Oh, reason. okay. No? No. Not I'm, hearing me? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's sorry. Just, sorry. Uh, no, you're you're good. Um, we're just working through testing issues. Um, yeah. you don't hear me. Technical issues. You don't hear me. Or you um, do hear me. I'll just hang tight here, Alex. Wait, are you talking? I'm talking right now. Do you hear me? Yes. T testing. Yeah, everybody says they all hear everybody. We're, we're good. We're good. Alex was eating too many donuts again. He's imagining. So the audience can hear me. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, okay. So I'm on the deer stand. The sun yeah. barely was cracking up, just barely, just twilighty kind of um, light. Yeah. And I get hit with this huge stink to the point yeah. where I had to cover my face with my scarf. I tuck yeah. my thing, and then yeah. I hear chest beating, and the chest beating um, yeah. was not a grouse. It yeah. was like I could feel my body vibrate, and um, everything then left as quick as it came. A stink left. The chest yeah. beating stopped, and the way yeah. I remember it, Scott, is as we went, we met for lunch. That was like a quarter mile away. I met for lunch. We all yeah. connoitered back there, and. Everybody had mentioned him, even Ron, that we that he had smelled this terrible stink that lasted yeah. a minute, and you yeah. for sure smelt it. Your brother Mark smelt it. Ron smelt yeah. it, and I smelt it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, thinking that it would have been a Bigfoot never crossed my mind at at that moment that that I can remember anyway. But what I did think about was a big buck in rut and they stink really really bad you know they're all they urinate all over themselves and blah yeah. blah blah uh, yeah. uh, thinking that 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 may have been it but when it was explained and we talked about it uh it, it wasn't that so um that, no that i mean this smelled like rotten flesh right that's yeah that that smell that's so uh omitted or omitted by that animal or thing is so different and so unique it cannot be um confused with something else yeah yeah and i've never i've only i've heard chest beating now um i heard it up north by you know up where we were hunting i heard uh, it at the pinshaw national forest and i heard it in upstate new york it was the only three times i've ever heard chest yeah beating. Yeah. yeah 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 um Maybe some of the, some of the people that listen to you uh, probably don't know exactly what you're talking about between a partridge and 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 a, and a possible squatch. Right. Is that when a partridge uh, goes to beat his wings, he starts out one, two, three, four, really slow, and then works into a frenzy and quits. Yeah. But when uh, when a squatch does that, it's immediate, uh, hard, multiple times fast. Yeah. You know, you 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 cannot uh, uh, say that that was a partridge. Just, there's no well, way. I had gone. I had been lucky enough to go partridge hunting many, many times before that. Yeah, and yeah. they, you know, they do a wing beat, and it just sounds like yep. feathers. You know, you can hear the air moving. Yep. This was something that went right through my body. It felt like yep. I was getting yep. hit. And this was before they had invented those big bass speakers. You know, mm -hmm. the ones that somebody pulls up next to you and you, you feel your body yeah, vibrate because yeah. I got the bass yeah. turned up. It was just yeah. like that. It was insane. So Intense, intense sound. 
Yep. Yeah. Um, John Ayers asked me where in upstate New York. It was near Whitehall. I actually was with okay. Brian Goslin, the police yeah. officer, when we heard chest beating. So. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm very, very, I'm, I'm very, very, very aware of that situation or that Whitehall area. So. Yeah, it's cool. So, okay. Yeah. Um, you used to own a camp up on Lac Sewell, I believe. Yep. Canada, yeah. Yep. And it was what? Golden Eagle Resort? Right. Yeah, it was the Golden Eagle Resort, Lac Sewell's Golden Eagle Resort. And uh, Northwestern, on, North, Northwestern Ontario, all, almost at the end of the road. So the last stoplight in uh, Ontario at that, at that area was Red Lake, Ontario, and that's the end of the road. So. Um, and you know, um, Scott, nobody ever told me you owned a lodge in Ontario. <laughs> oh, yeah. For you some know, reason, I, talking, I never knew. Yeah, I was talking with Alex about that here a while back, and I felt I, I feel really, really bad that you never found out or that you no. didn't know. I, I, I would have, I just assumed, you know, and you know no. what happens when you assume things. Scott, I would have been up there in a heartbeat. <laughs> I know you would have. I know you would have. I remember the episode, um, uh, was it Monster Quest that it was aired on, when you and uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum and uh, 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 Blake was there and a, a few others. And yep. what was the name of the other scientist? Uh, that was Kurt know. Nelson, um, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Blaine. Yes. My son, yep, Blaine. Yep, yep, um, yep. And, and then um, you know, uh, he, uh, the short person, the uh, scientist or doctor, he was an anthropologist, I believe, dark, long hair. Um, Esteban Sarmiento. Esteban, yes, thank you. But, uh, yeah, I, I remember that episode. Uh, what I started off to tell you was that area is like an hour or so, an hour and few minutes as the crow flies from where I had the camp. Oh, are you kidding me? No, it's only You're five, right, Lex Sewell, it's right, because I, I remember flying over Lex Sewell on the way to Selgrove sometimes when he had to, like, dodge some bad weather, yeah, he'd fly yeah, over Lac Sewell. Yeah, you probably flew over the very southern end of it. Yeah. So, did you I, did you ever meet Chuck? Water. Did you ever meet Chuck, the float plane pilot that ran that camp? Yes, I have. Yes, I, wow. I, I know who Chuck is. I have met him at sport shows. Um, That's for, crazy. For, Small for, world, man. Almost, right, yeah, it is. For almost 20 years I doing sports shows, you run into people that you get to know and you see them the following year and and you know all about them. And then uh, on top of that, uh, I sat on the uh, board of uh, tourism, Sunset Country Tourism for 15 years or so, and you get to meet people. So, but yeah, Chuck is very, very well known. Um, nice guy. Well, okay. A couple things. One, David Ellis made a yeah. comment. Alex, I want you to put it up about chest beating. If you see it up there, you, uh, you want me to what? No, I was going to have Alex put up a comment about oh, chest oh, beating. Oh, I, um, yeah. Go ahead and read that, Alex. Uh, Doug, I have sent you some of my chest beating recordings. It's a slapping sound with a slight cupping of the hands. Mm -hmm. that creates a hollow popping sound. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's exactly, and it's so intensely loud. Um, a partridge, a partridge's wing when they thump is muffled. Mm -hmm. Sounds like feathers. You know it? It's loud, but it's it, it's a muffled thump. Do I make any sense? But I yeah. when I say yep, that, yep. so uh, yeah, very very differently. It's distinct. Yeah. There's no way to mistake the two. No, no. Um, Okay, so um, first off, I'm going to ask you a question I've never asked you. I've never mm -hmm. talked to you or asked you because we were, we were kind of kids, right? Did yeah. your dad ever talk about any good Bigfoot stories, or did he ever hear oh, absolutely. anything? Absolutely. Oh, really? He was a firm. He was a firm believer, Doug, but he never wanted any, anybody to know. Uh, I remember, uh, I believe it was '67. Uh, it's when the when the Patterson Gimlin film was released into theaters. Yeah, somewhere in there, '67, '68, maybe. Anyway, um, we went to the Mako in Virginia. Dad, Dad took Mark and I to the Mako. Tickets were cheap. The film was only about twenty five minutes long or so, and we seen that in person. That the original footage. Wow. 
and uh, he was fascinated by these things. Um, I, I remember many years after that, I was, of course, growing and had my own family. He was working at a, at the mines over here at Tech Night, and he was going on vacation. And you know, he went west for his vacation one one year, and out to Washington and visited uh, all kinds of people and areas that were supposed to have had these things. Uh, you know, sightings of squatches and and so yeah, I know he was a very avid uh, believer, if you if you can say that. Do you think your dad ever had any kind of experience that he just didn't talk about? Uh, I really don't know, Doug. But there was one story that comes to my mind that Omer, you know, Omer, great grandpa Omer. Yes, yes, absolutely. Omer has a. Um, Omer told my dad stories, and I don't know if I, I, I would like to share this with you anyway. I don't know if Please. you have heard this story. No, probably there not. Was a, there was an old trapper that lived near Omer or somewhere up there in the Capitoga area at, back in the day that uh, hermits lived in the woods in a shack. The guy salted his own meat, cured his own meat, put up all his own food, lived out there with nothing. He had, there was no power, no no nothing and uh he ended up having something breaking into the meat shack the smoke shack and, and taking and destroying the the meats that he had ready to survive on to live on and he figured he was going to catch this thing and, and and shoot it and uh, assuming it was a black bear because there's a lot of black bears up in that area that's and huge black bears um anyway so I, and I don't know, and I don't remember it correctly, but it it sounded like uh, Omer was on the roof with him. They actually sat on the roof of his cabin, or maybe the guy was alone, waiting for this thing to come back. And it did, and it got into the meat shack again, and it realized that there was somebody on top of the roof of the cabin, and it stood there at the cabin and put his paw, his hands or paws on the roof looking at these guys. That's how tall it was. And when when you hear stories like that, you think, well, you know, that cabin must must have been really close to the ground, or or that was that more th or that wasn't a bear that stood there, you know, and put his paws on the roof and looked up at him, you know. So I don't know, but uh, those are the kind of things that Grandpa and my dad used to talk about all the time. God, would it be, it would be so cool because that was, of course, my grandfather too, right? Everybody, yeah, yeah. it was it was my great grandfather, yeah. Omer. Yes, yeah. and he was yeah. he was the one that taught me how to fish. Um, he lived in a cabin he built himself. It was a beautiful cabin yes. up on Lake Capitogama. Yes, yep, um, near Wooden Frog Peninsula area. Yeah, and I would go up there every summer and spend part of the summer up there at the cabin. Right, right. We all did. Yeah. yeah, and they used to they used to tie me to the dock because I never wanted to go in ever. I'd go out of that dock, and he'd give me a bucket of bait and a fishing rod, and then they, yeah, so I was like, they couldn't get me off the dock. I wanted to stay there, yeah. so they tied yeah. me. They were worried about yeah. me, so they tied me to did, the dock. Yeah. Did Grandma ever come down and fish with you? Never, no. Never? Oh. No, she she yeah. didn't. Um, um, uh, she just stayed up there and would visit with my mom or, you know, visit, yeah, whatever. Yeah. She was, she was amazing lady. And, you know, yeah, God, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think you could get any more hugs from anybody. She's no, hug, no, hug, no, hug, 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 hug. Sweet lady. Thora, yeah. Thora was a fantastic fisherman. She really was. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No, I yeah. can only imagine. Um. So, so, so my great grandfather had Bigfoot stories. You're just sure, you're sure about that, huh? Well, um, the stories I heard from him were never, he never said Bigfoot or anything like that. But the stories I heard just could not be a, like that one I just told you. It could not be a bear. Dog. That, that was no bear. Okay. No, but this is something uh, that he experienced. Yeah. Alex, okay, let's just take a second here. I want you to think about this, Alex. This is my great grandfather. I'm hearing the story for the first time who had a Bigfoot experience and me a sighting up in the north woods of Minnesota. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah. That's 
So you guys are more connected than you thought. Yeah. I uh, I wish Alex and they could have known him. He was yeah. something else. Oh man. Oh. Yeah. A man of very That's few crazy. words. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And when and when he did speak, it was. Uh, he was, you listened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He bought me my first. He also got me involved in you know, interested in electronics. Because when I was really oh, young, he bought me really? a very expensive transistor radio as a gift. Really? Grandpa Casa did, yeah. Well, did you ever play with the radio that was in the old cabin? No. The one that had uh-uh. the tubes in it? No. No, when you I, I did it with tube radios at my other yeah, my dad's yeah. father um oh, yeah. the tube uh, thing but this was a transistor radio it was a magical device when mm-hmm. I was a kid um, sure. well, probably a it, yes. pretty expensive gift back then but anyhow so okay so your dad um your dad lived I mean he's lived in the Northwoods forever and obviously the um the lake home that he had was absolutely mm-hmm. phenomenal mm-hmm. With, on that private lake and the huge fish in yeah. that lake. Was, it was just magical there. It really was. Yeah. That's when he was living there, Doug, is when he took his vacation one year out, out west. And I believe he kind of killed two birds with one stone because he was going to visit a relative of ours that's out there. There's, there uh-huh. is an animal living out there. Okay. Uh, so exactly what part of that that state or where he went exactly, I'm not quite sure, but it, it was mountainous region. So, you know, I don't know. Okay, yeah. so okay, so let's go back to your lodge. Okay, yeah. so you own this lodge. You've had it for quite a few years. Uh-huh. There was something odd that you said would happen in the spring yeah. that you would yeah. notice, and you uh, knew it was a little. How would we say out of place? We want to tell that yeah. story. Actually. Actually, I thought somebody was playing games with me or just trying to be rude, um, you know, being mean, uh, being a whatever. Uh, but we would come up, you know, winter up there hung around for a long time. And it wasn't uncommon for me to go up there in uh, uh, April, late April or May and still, and still have four or five feet of snow on the ground. Um, but what we... We'd show up for the spring uh, opening, and we'd start getting the camp ready. And of course, I have riding lawnmowers because it's a big area to mow, and Alma likes to mow lawn. And and uh, she was constantly hitting rocks. Okay, and these weren't little rocks; these were some of them were baseball size rocks or or uh, tennis ball size, golf ball size. Um, and we thought that was so unusual, and they assuming they were being pushed up through the ground over, over the winter. And that's why they were laying in the grass because they weren't there last year when we left. Uh, so I didn't know what was going on. People yeah, you would have noticed, you would have noticed rocks. What's that? How big, how big are these rocks? You would have noticed. How big were they? Um, like I said, some of them, some of them were as large as a baseball. Yeah. yeah. He would, he would have noticed those Alex, yeah. you know, Matter of fact, we did pick up rocks off the driveway that were that were much larger than a, than a softball. So wow, I had a driveway that went rocks. all the way around the backside of camp and came back out of the road that you go in on. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. Did anyway, you ever? Did you ever? He, did you ever hear um, any Bigfoot stories from any of the bush pilots? Any any of the other outfitters up there? Did did you guys ever talk about Bigfoot privately? Anybody? They refused to talk about it, though. That's what I figured. Yep. Um, up there, nobody talked about it. I uh, When I first started that business, I, uh, I ended up hiring an older gentleman. He was native. Um, and he was quite old at that, at that time. And I finally had the opportunity to sit with him down by the boathouse and ask him, you know, about Bigfoot. And he looked at me kind of funny. And I don't know if I can say this or not, but he, he asked me what I was smoking. <laughs> he was serious. I, you know, I said, seriously. Um, he says, you mean the old man? You know, and that's, that's, that's what he calls it, the old man. That's what they call him, the old people. So, but he, he didn't talk about, about it. He didn't say anything about it or gave me any information or 
or where they possibly could be. All he said to me was at the end of our conversation, he said, just leave them alone. That's all. And that's all they want is to be left alone. So that's interesting. interesting. Yep. Um, Okay. So let's go back to the, the woods and or back where, where we were there. And then you came back. Was it two years later, a year later? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And you well, had it. You had an experience you have not shared yet. What, oh yeah. what happened? Yeah, no. It's a uh, matter of fact. I haven't told many people about this at all because I still think I'm nuts. But uh, um, I was up there hunting again. Dave was with me, my brother-in-law, and uh, his his brother and some other people. We were up there hunting. Matter of fact, that was the year I was helping him. He had a small guiding service, deer hunting guiding service. And we were guiding some guys from Texas. They were shooting. Uh, they were hunting with uh, pistols, scopes on them. And they were very afraid of that, of, of the wooded Minnesota. Minnesota is so thick to them. They're used to hunting out in the open. So they were very, very cautious. But anyway, I was in a stand. And this stand was built a year or two prior to me sitting in it by myself and David and a few others worked on it. And we had cut shooting lanes in the woods. So you could see straight to your left and right, except and cross that shooting lane, you could have a clear shot to it. Okay, there's no brush in the way. You would be able to see exactly what you're shooting at. So uh, I had heard some some noise behind me, which I assumed was a squirrel crunching through the leaves. And it was moments after that is when I when I smelt my the very first time I ever had an odor that I smelt it I could not explain Doug um, was that was that moment and it dissipated as fast as it came. Yeah. Now um, I was staring down this sh- the shooting lane to my left and looking at a tree on the side on the edge of this shooting lane. These lanes are only a couple feet wide at the at the most maybe a foot and a half you know. They're not very, very wide. Um, and I'm looking at a tree, a large tree, which I assumed was a popple, a mature popple that was cracked or, or broken in two about a third of the way up a normal, you know, 15, 20 feet off the ground, whatever. At least that's what it looked like to me. Um, a tree that was broken. And it was grayish in color, like a, like an aspen would look, an old aspen tree from the, in the bush. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, I do not remember that tree being there. Seriously, where, why haven't I seen that before? You know, sitting on the edge. That was all small brush in that area. That area had all been logged off, so there shouldn't have been any trees in there at all. Um, It was all overgrowth, a a year or two, a two year old overgrowth of fresh timber. But uh, um, I turned again to my right i believe and i looked back and i could not find that tree again i looked looked. i was so flabbergasted was i seeing things i could not find what i was looking at it just it bothered me so much it gave me the 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 boobies okay so um that's that's my story yeah i can't I, i i can't explain that but there, there, the only thing I can explain is that there had to have been something standing there looking at me, and it was far enough away I could not make out details. I couldn't tell you what it was and what it wasn't. Um, so, you know, add all that up. What does it add? What, what does it come out to be? Um, yeah, and this is, this is literally the same area where I had my first, I guess you would call yeah. it a Class B encounter within a within a half mile of where you were you and uh your your friend were sitting yeah that's crazy absolutely crazy um uh, i want you to stay on scott Mm -hmm. we're going to be on for another half hour i want to do technological breakdown and i want to talk about these microscopic tiny little thermal cams that you can buy now And I want to go through and give people ideas on what they can do with them. And you can chime in any time you want, Scott. Okay. All right. Are are, are, are you talking about the cameras that you and I talked about? 
No, actually, this is something totally different. These are thermal oh, okay. cameras, IR thermal cameras. And this oh, was brought to my right. attention by a new friend that I made. And by the way, another coincidence that happened is a good, fr a new, a new friend, but he's a good friend of mine, Jeff Perella, who's in our chat. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Jeff and you know each other. Been, I've known Jeff for years. Yes. And, and tell us how, how do you know Jeff? <laughs> well, I have a hobby. Uh, very, very few people know about. I've been doing it since I was 15 years old. Um, I build radio controlled airplanes and I'm good at it now. Being I'm, I'm older, I do have trophies from it. Um, and back in the day, I actually operated and uh, was involved with uh, as being an officer with the local club here in town. I was an officer for the club and, and also an instructor, an AMA instructor. So I taught him and his son to fly airplanes oh, and he was still involved with the, with the, with the pizza business at that time, you know, yeah. and he, where it originated. So yeah, I, I, I know his brother too, very, very well. It's small. Oh, and by the way, and speaking of pizza business, oh. yeah, Jeff, I can see, I can see you in chat. Can I, can we run that commercial for your pizza business? Cause it involves Bigfoot. So Jeff's got to let me know if we can run that. We'll, we'll play it. You have access to that, don't you, Alex? Yeah, I've downloaded it. That was really a cute commercial. Very, very nice. Yeah, and, and nice Jeff there. goes, Scott uh, is phenomenal. He's a phenomenal yeah. RC pilot, and I see you're building a huge plane in your basement right now. Huge RC. Me? Me? Are you talking about me, Doug? Yeah, 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 you. Uh, it's not my basement. I, it's a, it, that's a large heated room in my garage, built inside oh, my garage. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It's massive yeah, plane. This plane, you can almost get in. Are... You can almost get in. Okay. So let's um, let's go ahead and do um, – oh, okay. So Jeff says go ahead and play the commercial. So let's play this. Jeff is a Bigfoot fan, or he wouldn't be listening to the podcast. I met him after he had been listening to the podcast. And he had also was a Hangar One customer. And anyhow, yeah. we hired another gal, and she's good friends with um, uh, Jeff's but good friend. And so anyhow, finally we ended up getting together. So that's how it, how it went. Plus, Abe introduced me to Sammy's Pizza because they had their VIP dinner there for their conference. It was the best chicken wings and pizza I'd ever eaten in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, there's something yeah. different here. And so I was oh, thinking, on, I was thinking on driving Scott four hours to go back to this place. And then Yvette yeah. heard me talking about it and she goes, there's one right here in town. And I went, what? Yeah. So that night, Scott, I ordered like a hundred chicken wings, but then Joe came oh, over oh, the next oh. day and I said, I'll make you chicken wings. And then Joe was eating the chicken wings. He, where'd you get these? They're really good. I said, Sammy's. He goes, oh, that guy wants to meet you. Really? So that's how we got together with Jeff. And then we got together, yeah. we realized. Yeah, if, that, if, if Jeff can hear me. Hi, yeah, Jeff. he can. Nice to, um, I'm so glad that you're on and that you're involved. It's uh, just nice to uh, have an acquaintance with you again. And Jeff, anyhow, so I meet Jeff. We had so many things in common. It was scary. And yeah. then I find out that he even knew that you, he goes, do you know Scott Angove? And I'm like, yeah, that's my cousin. Yeah. And he goes, he taught me how to fly RC planes. He's a great teacher. Anyhow, so yeah. that's the deal. Well, go ahead and, Alex, if you want to play this commercial, me and Jeff threw this together um, just the other night. It didn't take us too long. Do you have it, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just waiting for it to download. Oh, okay. Well, I'll keep keep talking. But anyhow, so in technological breakdown, um, Eric Sorensen, who I hope is listening, um, I believe he is, he brought these cameras to my attention. He reviewed them. Um, he said they're absolutely phenomenal. And, of course, when we get going here, we're going to talk about all the cool things you could do with these. So let's play the commercial, and we're going to do the bumper for the tech breakdown. And... Uh, Okay, it'll be uh, it's uploading. It'll be done in just a second here. Oh, okay. You could have just pulled it off my Facebook page. 
Mm. That's low res. Are those, Doug, are those cameras rechargeable? Uh, that's a good it, question. They're not really, no, you don't charge them. You just hang on, Scott. You'll you'll hear how you run these. It's yeah. really cool. Okay. Just hang on. Okay, I got the. Do you want me to play the ad now? Yeah, go ahead and play Sammy's Pizza ad. I love Sammy's Pizza, and you will too. Check out our new Sasquatch Pizza that is so delicious. It's handcrafted with a blend of barbecue chicken, sweet onion, creamy mozzarella, and cheddar cheeses. An ingenious combination of flavors that will satisfy your huge monster appetite. And for a limited time only, get a free junior-sized cheese footprint pizza with any 14 or 16-inch Sasquatch pizza. Sammy's Pizza. It's a family tradition since 1954. I forgot to mention, a portion of profits will actually go to fund. Scientific Sasquatch research in the new legend meets Science 2 film coming soon. Only available at Sammy's Pizza in Ramsey, Minnesota. Go to mysammys.com or call 763-205-4653. And there you go. That commercial is just fantastic. You guys did yeah. a really, really nice job. So hopefully the rest of the chain adopts this new little uh, ad campaign. It was fun. Yeah. Me and Jeff had fun putting it together, and it was kind of a learning yeah. experience for him to see how this is all done. And, yeah, I uh, think people are going to – people warm up to stuff like that pretty easily. Yeah. Well, I named the Bigfoot Yum. That's the name of the Bigfoot. And Jeff is going to have T-shirts available. If anybody wants to get a hold of a T-shirt, we'll have those ready here pretty soon. And we'll yeah. probably throw them in our store too, and and Jeff will have them for sale. And um, but anyhow, um, and Abe is the one from Minnesota Bigfoot um, Research Team. He's the one who introduced me to Sammy's, and um, I just couldn't comprehend it. The VIP dinner at Sammy's was like, what the hell? I even told Abe, I've like, I've never had chicken wings this good ever. <laughs> so or pizza, it was crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. it's a small world, everybody. Yeah. And this yeah. is, this is, yeah, Jeff goes, Doug did all the work. No, I didn't, Jen. You were, yeah, no, you gave me a lot of ideas. But we, but the, the point I'm trying to make is by communicating, you'll find out you have all sorts of common friends. This goes for everybody. It's truly the Kevin Bacon. Uh, what is that? The seven degrees from Kevin Bacon, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. That they say everybody's related. Seven people and you're related to Kevin Bacon through seven different people. It's up to you to find out who those people are. So I guarantee you have relatives and friends who know friends who have a relative that's related to Mark DeWorth <laughs> or, or my, or my, my cousin Scott here. <laughs> so yeah. It's kind of weird. It really is. Um, but it's true. Yeah. It's so true. If you just look, you know, you just got to look. Okay. So now we're going to move on to another new friend I met. Um, we also have a ton of stuff in common. First time me and Eric talked, we're on the phone for three hours. And I find out Eric is building um, a really incredible vehicle specifically for Bigfoot research. And, of course, I asked Eric to join the Legend Meet Science um, uh, research team. And Eric agreed to do that. So he's part of the tech crew. Um, and, um, okay. So let's go ahead and play that. Let's play the bumper, Alex. I know you love playing that bumper. Yes. <laughs> okay. Tonight we are going to talk about the infrared X H O nine X two. I'll get the information to Alex. He can put a link. And these are for Apple or Android-based uh, phones, right? And they cost about 300 bucks. So they, right now, I think they're on sale for like $299 if you're a Prime member on Amazon. I don't own this company. I don't have anything to do with it. I'm not affiliated in any way. Um, I'm going off um, this uh, initial introduction from Eric. <clears throat> but then I did my own research on it. Okay, so I want you to look. Look at the look at the phones. 
You see that little tiny thing that's about as wide as the fire wire at the bottom, Alex? Yeah, it's tiny. That's a camera. What? Not only is that the camera, that's a thermal camera. That's incredible. Okay, but you're like, well, I don't want to attach it to my phone. Hell no, I don't either. Get an extension cord. It's a, U, a UBC. Is that it? Is that right? UBC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. US, is it USB-C? USB-C cord. And we're going to do some experiments to see how long we can make our own extension cords. But even if you can just do 10 foot, and I know you can buy 10 footers, you can still now hide it outside of your home, outside of a tent, outside. Because now, like I said, this thing's like, I think it's under a half inch wide. That's tiny. Alex, does that plug into your charging port also? Yeah, it just plugs into the charging port on the phone. So if oh, you yeah. want an extension, what you have to do is just plug the camera into the extension cord, plug the other half into your phone, and you're rocking just like it's plugged into your phone. But here's where Eric um, was really impressed. He said the palette on this thing and the and the clarity is up there with even far more expensive thermal cameras. Like I said, $300. Plugs right into the bottom of your cell phone or get a, get a cord because then you can let your imagination run wild. You can hide the thermal camera in food and apple. Um, once again, a pop can. Uh, do it something like this. So here's like, let me get this up here. So here's like a, a decoy dove for dove hunting you can get. Put a hole in it. Not even that big. Um, you could have this camera, the, uh, the lens aimed out the eyeball. It's that small in the lens. So, and hide it in a tree. Run a 10-foot cord. Find somebody you know that does soldering. Solder up a 20-foot or a 30-foot or test it out. Wire is cheap, people. Um, it may not be quite as strong of a signal, but if it'll work, it's still cool. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about, you know, thermal cameras in general are not going to be they're not going to be accepted if you get footage of a Bigfoot with a thermal camera, unless it's close up and you have a lot of it, it's not going to have a lot of scientific acknowledgement, right? It's just not. It's not going to be clear enough because it's, you know, processing the IR, the infrared, the evasivity, the difference in temperature is what it measures. Um, and let's jump right to, um, before I get into a bunch of de quick details, Jump to photo two, Alex, of this cat that Eric sent me. This is one of the palettes, just one of many palettes this camera has. And you can see where this cat's losing heat through its eyes and through its mouth. But it's losing a lot of heat there. That would be actually a really good initial setting to have your thermal camera if you're monitoring live. Um, because it's not going to give you, it's not going to show up trees and rocks and things. You're just going to see these eyes glowing. And one thing we do know for sure is Bigfoot's eyes are absolutely the, the, the one spot they're going to be losing the most heat, our eyeballs. I've done a ton of even research with um, uh, black bears in the wintertime, and they lose very little heat. They have very little heat signature, except through the very tip of their muzzle, and their eyes. You know, you don't get much of a heat signature. And depending on, you know, how long and what temperature it is, the eyeballs are definitely going to give away the location. Then you can quickly change palettes. And this camera, um, Eric says, it's got the best palettes he's ever seen. Um, I have more pictures. I didn't want to bore you with a whole bunch of stuff. And Eric had just got them to me. So maybe next week, we can we have time, Alex, to download a bunch of videos from this camera. But here's here's the point I'm trying to make, everybody. This is a tiny thermal camera. Take advantage of it. Hide it. Put it in the bushes. Drill a little hole in a tree. Get creative. Do that multi-step process. That's how you're going to get footage. Multi-step. Um, monitor it. Um, you're basically its point of interest. If you're in a tent, um, you know, these things come into camps all the time. Once again, run a cord out the side of the tent and hide it in something. 
Um, okay, so let's get into just a little bit of the specs. Um, thermal cameras are always very low res compared to a like a video camera. So don't expect you're going to blow it up real big. Uh, the resolution on this thing is 256 by 192 pixels. So it looks really clear, small. But if you blew this cat up really big, it would look very pixely. But they look great, um, small. So think about thermal cameras as kind of a confirmation tool. That one, you have Bigfoot's in the area. Two, um, um, nothing's going to be able to hide from you. They can be behind a whole bunch of bushes, Alex. They can't hide. You're going to see it. You're going to see a heat signature back there. You're going to see the eyes blinking. You're going to see things. But just don't expect that suddenly all the scientists are going to like clamor to you and go, oh, that proves Bigfoot. No, it won't. You're going to need, in order to do that, we're going to need a lot of clear, close-up daytime footage with a video camera. That could help raise the bar greatly scientifically, like the Patterson footage did, right? It's daytime. It's out in the open. I think it's fairly clear for film footage of a you know, 16 millimeter. Um, it's too bad the creature was so far away from Bob and Roger. Um, okay, so let's see here. What else? Um, I know I'm talking a mile a minute. Um, so, okay, so thermal cameras are really, really good in zero light. And I've, like, we were up at Snow last time, Snow Grove, Alex and, and Scott. There was zero light. I mean, there was thick cloud cover, no moon. You could put your hand in front of your face and be outside, and you would not see it. I mean, when I say zero light, I mean darker than dark. This is a perfect tool for that. If I would have had one of these little cameras, I mean, it would be really, it wouldn't be a game changer, but be damn interesting. So guess what we're doing? We're going back up. We're bringing these cameras. We may even hide one in a robot that Jeff is building right now of a baby Bigfoot. So. Um, yeah, yeah. Take it to the garbage can with me. Absolutely. It would, it would, it would show all those m monsters that are lurking on the edge of my garbage cans. So hopefully, hopefully Yvette took the garbage out tonight. Um, so don't, if you're going to get a thermal camera, if you're in the market for one, don't spend over 300 bucks on one. Just don't. The technology is changing so quick. This proves it, right? The last thing you want is a $2,000 thermal camera that's going to be obsolete next year. You know, none of us are that rich that we need to spend money on stuff that's going to go bad on you. Get something like this that you can use in a conventional way or you can hide it. I love the versatility of this thing. And so, I mean, that's, that's really cool. Um, and I think what we'll do is talk more about it next week. And then I'll bring up some other topics that are completely new. But this thing is also IP65 rated, and that means you cannot submerge it in water, but it can withstand rain, okay? So you're not going to be putting it in the pond, but if it rains, generally it's good. This thing only weighs 19 grams, very tiny. tiny. Um, and I think Eric is going to be doing some experimenting, right, Eric? And you're going to be testing longer cords because you cannot believe the specs that they give you at the factories. I've learned that. I was told video signal would not go past, you know, 100 foot. And I've used it up to 1,000 foot. And when I did the squid, the giant squid, we got footage of that. That was a 1,000 foot cable that got that. I was told it would not work. So don't believe specs, you know, from factories. They're doing those specs saying, this is only good to this, or this cord will only work this long. It's because they just need to cover their butt. They don't want to. They don't want to lead people on with false information. I don't blame them. Um, and so this is made once again by Infrared. Do you want to put that camera up again so people can put their yeah. cell phone snap the screen if they want? And it's this is touted as the um, smallest thermal camera in the world. That's a big deal. That really is. Super yeah, big I, deal. When I think of a thermal camera, I think of a huge camera. So to see something this small. Right. When I first started using thermal cameras, and I know we were the first, it was me and Matt Moneymaker and Autumn 
were the first to get a thermal camera um, borrowed to us that was in color palettes. And we would suspend it from a very high altitude balloon, a helium balloon. It was a micron, um, really great quality for back then. But um, but they were 55 grand back then. I mean, they were in the $50,000 range. You can only imagine how nervous I was getting hanging a $55,000 camera from a balloon, right, on a gimbal. It's kind of scary, right? Um, uh, so it says uh, consumption of only uh, 0 0.2 watts, 2.5 watts. So it said it'll work five to seven hours on an iPhone. And then, um, yeah, basically you see that picture of that camera connected to that phone, and you know how big those phones are. That's yeah. tiny. It's yeah. about the width of a button on the phone, on an iPhone. Scott, yeah. what do you think? Scott, what do you think of these? Well, things? I think. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm about buying one. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was just going to break in and ask you a question. Yeah. Scott's dad, by the oh. way, was an incredible electrical engineer. I'm probably self-taught, I would imagine. Yeah, he was. But your dad helped me Johnny. out with so many um, electrical projects. It wasn't even funny. Your dad was amazing. Yeah. And when he'd say, hey, I'll build you a control panel for that. Man, he would always yep. deliver and it would always work perfect. And the quality was like factory, everything his dad built. And I would imagine he passed some of those skills on to you. Am I not correct? I remember when he built that system for your business to, to preheat the. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, press. The, it was a whatever press. You want to call them, yeah. But uh, um, the question I have is how old of an iPhone will that thing work with? Or can it just be an iPhone period? Um, I, that I do not know, but I would imagine probably from iPhone, whenever they start using lightning uh, cable or the, or the, what is it? UBC cable for Android. I would imagine right. that would work, but they should have their specs. They have a phone number. You can give, give their customer service a call if you have questions. Yeah. If you buy it from Amazon, you know you can return it. If it doesn't work, yeah. which is really cool. Um, I love the fact that um, we're even going to try to put splitters. Eric is going to do some custom cables. And I know we'll get Adam involved in maybe some custom cables too. Adam, is, Adam Colt is really good at soldering up cables. Um, uh i'm trying to think anything else anybody else have any questions i don't want to bore not everybody's oh. in here to listen to uh um Doug? you know technology but um this thing also has image stabilization it's got amazing color battle palette good settings menu you can record video you can take still photos you can do a lot of stuff with it so my point is if it's cheap and it's small, you're going to use it more. I want to try it with a 50 foot cord, right? So that's kind of where that's I was the just direction. going to ask you that, Doug. Pardon? I said I was just going to ask you a question similar to that. So you yeah. think that that camera would work with a extension of 30 to 50 feet? I think it will. Yeah, I do. I yeah. don't. I think the specs say it won't, but I think it will just fine. You'll probably it'll probably eat battery in the phone quicker because you got all that resistance. You know, right. Um, the longer the cable, the more the cable, you know, sucks the power. Right. Yep. yep. Like when we did um, the um, 30 day project or Adam did it, I should say, he, he was the brains behind it. He, he um, we were using electrical cords that were buried in the forest, extension cords, outdoor extension cords. And um, he was running stuff way past what it should have been run, you know, and it worked. It worked just fine. So do stuff with it. Well, that's all I've got on that. Um, and uh, next week, we'll. I'm still. I have. I want to cover the tents. Got a whole bunch of tent stuff, tent technology, but I keep thinking, no, nah, this is more important. This is cooler than the tent thing. So. So we'll just keep we'll keep ideas coming in, everybody. And at some point we'll get we gotta get Eric on. So Yeah, that'd be pretty John's saying you should come to the come with them to the mines, Doug. He'll show yeah. you the dark. <laughs> yeah, God knows what we'd yeah. see with a thermal camera in the salt mine, John. Yeah. 
I can only imagine. So, um, Sedan walking that mine down there. If you you want to see blackness, that is incredible. Yeah. Well, thermal cameras, once again, um, so many people buy them. They're too complex for them to use. I have one I spent a bunch of money on. Every time I have to relearn all these buttons and all these settings, and it's just kind of a groan factor. It's like I would just like something to just grab, plug into my phone, and just run outside with, right? Take a camping because it's so tiny. It doesn't add any weight. It's not going to add weight to your backpack. A lot of people hike to their sites, you know, and yeah. you got to carry a big camera. It's not so fun. This K, I'm just looking yeah. at this thing, and I just bought it like three, four years ago, and it's to me, it's a dinosaur already. So, I know nothing about these things, Doug. Does does that little camera emit an IR? Like, it, it no, it, it receives IR. It doesn't emit it anything. Receives IR. It receives, okay. doesn't it? Doesn't emit. Okay. So the only light that would be emitted is nothing. If your if your phone monitor is far enough away, hence why we yeah. want to make fifty foot cables. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind the reason of, why I the reason why I ask is there are so many theories out there about animals able to see ir light yeah no it's that's to me an excuse um for why we're not getting game trail cameras photos okay. and i agree they probably can see the light if your ir emitters are on but they shouldn't yeah. be able to see passive sensors unless it's the plastic they use the white plastic they use with the passive sen sensors seem to have some phosphorescent powder in it and if they could also see in UV vision, those yeah. things would glow. Those passive sensors would glow, not from any light or energy, but from right. because of the plastic. That's right. it, just yeah. the plastic. So I want to also do things like um, uh, just take a take a, a green garbage bag, you know, the green like hefty garbage bag. Cut right. a little piece of the green garbage bag, and and. Get it like a, a spray adhesive and glue it over the white passive sensor and then get a UV flashlight and see if that white plastic glows anymore because it should penetrate that thin polyurethane plastic. Also, I don't know if you knew this, Scott, if you have a tent and you have portals in it and you put like tape some of that uh, green garbage bag material okay. over those tent holes, you can yeah. see right through that plastic as if it's not there with a thermal camera. Where thermal cameras will not work through glass. Okay. Thermal cameras will work. They will work with mirrors, though, which is interesting. Yeah. Right? You can use a mirror. You could do, you know, 45 degrees on a mirror, and you could maybe yeah. do some sneaky sneaky periscopic with a periscope and you can make a homemade yeah. periscope real easy with just two 45 degree mirrors in a piece right. of card you can make it out of cardboard piece and of hot glue piece of cardboard and yeah some duct tape and i used to make periscopes all the time when i was a kid out of uh just a little box just glued together with tape some duct yeah. tape and then you uh, glue in the mirrors and two <laughs> two mirrors at a 45 and i'd have a homemade periscope Maybe it's a periscope that may be able to get footage of these things. I don't know. Who knows? It didn't take much to, in those days for us kids to be a, a, amused by something, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know. What time is it? It's 54. Well, maybe we should. Do you have any more stories about uh, anything you want to talk about, Scott? Well, I got one that I like to share. Please. Um, uh, many, many, many years ago, I was probably 19. A friend of mine, I went camping on the St. Louis River on a three-day journey down to St. Louis. Okay. From northern Minnesota. Uh, we actually passed through a couple other area uh, rivers or lakes, whatever. Anyway, it was it was a long journey. And uh, the very last, uh, I believe it was the second or the last night that we were there, 
we had actually run out of food. We were able to find fresh water. We pulled over and found a person uh, that lived on the edge of the river. We walked up the hill and asked her for some fresh water. But um, we were completely out of out of food other than, I believe, some packages of oatmeal and whatever. And we, we were very, very hungry. <clears throat> so we sat on the river that night, hit by Roger and I. And we caught some really small little walleyes. I mean, I'm talking eight inches, you know, 10 inch long walleyes. Um, and we cleaned them up and, and ate them and went to, and went to bed. We we're sleeping in a two man pup tent. Okay. And, uh, the fire was burning down, burning down to embers. Um, we didn't like good woodsmen. We don't leave fires going overnight. that are full blow and roaring, you know, um, and lay in there for a few moments. Uh, we were still awake. Actually, we were talking, whispering. And back, I would say within 50 yards of us, to 100, 50 to 100 yards, a very large tree broke. I mean, it was it was big. It was a big tree broke, and it fell. And when it hit the ground, the ground shook. All right, now. It's like Roger says, uh, what are the odds of a person being in the woods, listening to a, a tree just naturally fall? Okay. Well, it, 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 it could happen. But that wasn't the only thing that happened that night. Later, I was, I was almost sleeping. Later, um, we heard a rock fall into the river. So we thought, we, we assumed a rock rolled off the bank of the river. But when we thought about it later, that rock had to have been thrown because when it hit the water, you could hear it hit the bottom of the river, the rocks on the bottom of the river. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Yep. Throw a rock into shallow enough yes, water. Sir. To hear it. Yep. So uh, that uh, that occurred in that in that that rock was huge. It had to have been huge yep. to make that kind of a sound and splash. And and my my buddy was trying to talk everything, try to come up with another solution. Oh, it was probably a turtle, you know. Um, he did not want to admit, and he still doesn't, um, he, he doesn't want to take any responsibility of what yeah. of what really happened. He just denies everything. But uh, um, we went to bed finally, or we, we finally fell asleep, I should say. And uh, I don't know what time it was during the night, but I woke up. I woke up to something around the tent sniffing. Okay. Uh, like a like a like a dog would sniff something, you know, yeah. making a noise. But it was it was intense and it was loud. And once well once in a while I would uh, hear a slight uh, grunt, whatever, when it was sniffing. I mean, it, I assumed it was a bear. Um, I have seen bears, you know, around tents sniffing, but. This was making a lot, a lot. Of well, wouldn't it have been cool, Scott, to have one of these thermal cameras outside? Oh, man. Back in those days, of course, you know, there was nothing like that at all. No. But all you had was a, an Instamatic or a, a Polaroid or a, a Kodak uh, disposable camera. But, uh, yeah, that would have been really, really neat. I, I, I would love to have seen what that was. Because whatever pushed that tree over or whatever fell, and that rock in the water like that, I mean... That that all occurred from something. It wasn't natural, Doug. All right. To this day, I will I will argue with anybody that was not natural. That was an in, intentionally done. Um, so, but to come around the tent like that, sniffing, and it was only huh, maybe uh, maybe two feet from my head only at times. Um, so yeah. Was it was it windy you that know, night that the tree fell? Excuse me. Was there any wind? No, absolutely none. It was none, dead yeah. still. Yeah. It was so quiet. It was so quiet. You know something? When I think about it, I don't. I don't remember hearing frogs or anything at that time. It was so quiet. It was spooky quiet. Wow. Um, so uh, I finally woke Roger up. I said, "Listen, there was something just now <laughs> around the tent. What was so odd is that we brought." Roger's dog with Yogi, big dog, big black dog. He was crossed between a lab and a, and a huge collie. And he was a big, black, hairy, uh, picture a black collie, but just 
gigantic. And uh, he was a big baby, though. Um, we brought him with poor protection or for early warning, actually, you know, an alarm type thing. Um, Yogi kept on trying to crawl into the tent and Roger would kick him out. You know, and okay, Yogi so the dog was scared. That, the dog, yes, the dog wanted to be in that tent with us so bad that he was whining. Huh. Uh, and Roger said, I don't know what's the matter with him. Well, to this day, I know what was the matter with him. He was he was scared, Doug. He was downright scared, that dog. That's uh, interesting. And dogs usually so, don't get afraid of bears for some reason. They'll tear after bears all the time. Yeah, yeah. But, There's something about these creatures that just scares dogs. They get really freaked out and scared. And they usually don't bark. They just whine. They just whine, yeah. Yep. yeah um, whine. David Ellis asked um, um, David Ellis from the Olympic Project, the sound uh, expert, he asked, Scott, did you ever go looking for the tree that fell? Uh, no, we were in a rush that following morning. And prior to all this happening, well, that particular day, my my knee went out on me and I tore the MCL or something in my left knee. So I was hobbling. I, I mean, I was barely moving around. Roger had to help me in and out of the canoe. I did not go look for it. Now, I wish I wish I would have. Wow. I truly wish I would have. How long ago Although was I this? I wish I would have walked over and, and where I heard that rock come, you know, come from. Yeah. Uh, there were sandy the, at that part of the river. It's all sandy banks on, on both sides. It's just a beautiful area. St. Louis River, really a pretty, pretty yep. river. Um, so, yeah, I, wish, I, I really wish I would have, Doug. Hindsight 2020. Yeah. Well, I've, 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 I've talked to other people that have literally been camping near the St. Louis River, on the St. Louis River, and have had rocks thrown at them. So. It's kind of a common thing. Um, have, you, have you heard of the white face monster? No. Uh-uh. Uh, no. Okay. You what know about. What is it? You know about the so-called squash that was put on ice. Bigfoot was put on ice many years ago. It was frozen, and it was investigated. The guy supposedly had shot it somewhere in in Minnesota. Have you White heard that face? story? No, I've never heard this story ever. Um, my dad claims that he worked with a man at Evelyn Taconite that actually shot one of these things during deer season. Um, I don't know any more than that, other than what he told me that he said he worked with this guy. I don't know any of the story, but it's documented, and I've seen the documentary on TV. About the Minnesota Iceman is what yeah. they call it. Yep, yep, yeah, I've heard about that, obviously. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, the Minnesota oh. Iceman. Oh, okay. Yeah, that there's so many stories. Up here in North, excuse me? Yeah, there's a lot of stories and rumors on where that thing was yeah, supposed right, to be shot. Right. And yeah. I actually got to meet Frank Hansen numerous times, but I actually went to Frank wow. Hansen's farm once. Did in you? The, yeah, in about 1970. It would have been 75. I was oh, at yeah. Frank Hansen's farm because I was looking for antiques. And Frank okay. Hansen was flirting with my girlfriend. Yeah, I was just being real friendly. And I snuck away. <laughs> um, and I just started because I was looking for I was looking for old ice boxes. I wanted to restore one. And so I snuck away, and there in the world is the coffin, the glass coffin. And I went, Holy sh crap, this has got to be Frank Hansen's place. So I go in, I look, and there's the Minnesota Iceman, the latex copy. But remember, oh, latex copy, yeah, yeah. And there, you could see the refrigeration unit was in disrepair. And my theory yeah, is, yeah. of course, that was a latex dummy all along. Yeah. That he would freeze the ice, put pig guts over the yeah. top, and then yeah. put another layer of ice. And I believe that his refrigeration unit went out, and you know yeah. he had this great big story about how. You know, he had to swap it because the FBI or whoever was after him. Yeah, I think right, his just right. refrigeration burned out and he didn't have time or was too cheap to replace it. And he just came up yeah. with another, you know, once you start lying like that, then it doesn't yeah, matter. Well, you know, that story man. changed like three times, you know. Yeah. You know, and I remember a single 
hair pour on the forehead when I was a little kid, standing on my tiptoes, looking at the Minnesota Iceman in the, in, in the uh, would have been like 68, at the state fair. And I remember seeing that pour on the forehead with two hairs coming out of it. Not one, two. And I looked at that and I went, oh, this thing's fake. Back in the yeah. 60s. And I, yeah. then when I saw the, the latex thing in his barn, I looked yeah. for that pour and there it was. So yeah. I don't care what anybody says, cryptozoologists, Tulevmans, and all these guys, yeah. they were fooled by the fact he had used real eyeball yeah. and he used real yeah. pig guts and the smell and the flesh. was all real. Yeah, yeah that was I was flesh. just going to ask you, did it? Do you, do you remember uh, it having any odor to it or stink to it? Not in the 60s. No. I mean, no. when you seen that coffin. No, that but coffin. all you got to re realize, if you put a steak in your freezer and leave it there yeah. too long and it gets a little yeah. warm on the surface, that flesh and blood, the real blood, which was real blood right. by either from a cow right. or a pig, it's, it's gonna crazy. stink. It's gonna still go bad, rancid. Yeah, it's gonna jump. smell. Yeah. What? Why they didn't consider yeah. the fact that somebody could easily freeze something in layers? And that's yeah. all I believe it was. I'm sticking to it because of those hair pores. Never looked right in the beginning. They didn't look yeah. right, and then of course I saw it melted in it's about seventy five um, um, uh, at his farm, and. Yeah. It's just, you know, when someone starts changing their stories, guys, that's a clue. Yeah. It's a sign. Is What's that comedian, Alex? Yeah. The guy that goes, it's a sign. Oh, Jeff, is it Jeff Foxworthy? It's one of those blue colors. Yeah, and he goes, it's a sign. What's your sign? Well, that's a sign, right? When yeah. you start hearing multiple stories from anybody, walk away, man. Yeah. It's not real. Yeah. Because yeah. Remember uh, looking at the eye on that thing? I'll, 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 yeah, it was I'll coming out because... And once again, it was just a, a latex thing, and he put a real yeah, pig eye. Yeah. yeah, it was real. Yeah. And that's how it fooled yeah. people. Yeah. You know, I remember being horrified looking at that when I was a child. Yeah. Going, oh, my that's God, it angers, got shot in the eye. That's what me about people when they talk about the Patterson-Gimlin film, how that was fake and stuff. When you think back at that period, that time, uh, yeah. And it's all it's it's been proven. I don't know how many times, Doug. That's not been faked. Uh, right? No. Well, that's yeah, a different yeah. deal. Um, uh, they didn't have stretch cool. fabric. They didn't have fake breasts. They didn't have silicone. No. Wasn't invented. No. Uh, no. The muscles are all contracting and expanding at the exact yeah. right time they yeah. should be. I love the part when that first came out, and Jeff Meldrum actually mentioned that the, the uh, uh, mentioned about the herniated thigh muscle on that thing when it was walking. They could well, see yeah, it. that was that was my discovery. Oh. Um, and I and even called before I even talked to Jeff about that. I called surgeons, yeah. and that was what they would call. And some of the surgeons said, "Well, it could be." A femora um, a hernia because um, he said, well, the first surgeon goes, oh, I fix those all the time. In yeah. females who get pregnant, they develop a hernia in their crotch um, from all oh. the weight. And then as they get po turned postpartum after the baby's born and they start losing weight, that hernia yeah. slides down their thigh and ends up right where the where it was in the Patterson creature. And I believe Patty was postpartum postpartum interesting that's interesting yeah so that's or or it's a highly developed femoris muscle because we cannot see the other side and the other yeah. weird the, the thing that confuses me scott alex try it walk bent knee don't lock your knees try to do it right. for 10 and minutes more. you're going to get a pain right where that that yeah. bump is rising right. in the muscle right at that spot. and you're going to tire out so fast yes yeah, you're going to burn out. So that could be just a highly developed um, femoris muscle, or it is a hernia, a hernia that women get when they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that the surgeons fix constantly. And that's where they end up settling, right on the thigh there. So it's yeah. absolutely, why that went unnoticed by everybody, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, I probably looped that footage back and forth more than anybody, because I had the right yeah. equipment to do so. I could do it digitally yeah. on my system. I developed a system yeah. called Frelling. 
forward, reverse, enhanced loops, frelling. Mm -hmm. And I did these frells. I would make these little frells up. And I would just sit there and play them for hours and stare at it. Go, what are you trying to tell me? Yeah. Yeah. What is what is there to learn here? What I would I just like I know you're trying to talk to me. Tell me what this is saying. And there I would was watch never, it over there and over. was never a wrinkle in the skin. There was no. never anything to indicate that that was a suit on a, on on a person. No, the only thing that was wrinkly was the armpit stretch skin that stretched exactly like That's an armpit. Normal. Bill Munns got a grant to study all of this stuff. The breast. The uh, adipose yeah. tissue on the back, you know, right. like where you get a little overweight and you get that fat tissue. Alex, yeah. you wouldn't know. Yeah. That fat tissue around your, above your hips. It's called yeah. adipose tissue that just kind of builds up there. And Patty had all of those qualities. Yep. And yeah. he matched them. Yeah. He had literally hired nude models to be able to document yeah. how that tissue performs. Right. And that right. took a lot of guts on Bill's part to do the extensive work that he did. Um, right. Once again, you know, believe it if you don't want to believe it. Don't believe it if you don't. If you don't want to believe it, believe yeah, it if you do. Yeah. But I can also tell you, I offered Bob Mil Bob Gim Gimlin a million dollars way back in the uh, in the day when I met Bob at Willow Creek, and we ended up all trekking to. Bluff Creek with Bob so he could go back to the mm -hmm. film site for the first mm -hmm. time. We got back and that night I said, Bob, I just got word. That my network will give you a million dollars. Literally write you a check. If you're willing to just sign a contract that you'll do a show with us on how you yeah. faked it. He goes, Doug, I'd love to take your money, but let me just tell you the story again. That's exactly how long it took him to get back to me. You know, he just, and he went and told me the whole damn story again, as if yeah. I didn't hear. It's like Doug, didn't you hear me the first time? You know, <laughs> that's not fake. Yeah. I can't do a show on how it's fake because I can't. You know. Yeah, I called him two years ago to wish him a happy birthday, and uh, he was sounding pretty tough then, Doug. So, wow. You know, yeah, he's, he's getting up, up there. there in age. He's getting up there, but man, I think I could outwalk me any day. Um, somebody oh, said, did you have a cash on that? No, but I had my network executive on, and he was willing to tell Bob, I'll wire it in your account as soon as we get the contract signed. So, And they would have, yeah. you know, would have been a great documentary if oh, he had a secret way to do it, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So that's, that's all I know. Um, by the way, for members, we want to announce for members, um, we're going to be doing – an announcement to the members we're going to be putting on a basically a private one on one with you members, myself, Alex, and we can even bring, you know, if there's some guest you want on there, but it's just for us. So we can all just talk literally mm -hmm. and spend as much time we want on the phone and uh, or like not on the phone on stream. We're going to use like StreamYard or conferencing software, yeah. right, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be a problem. That sounds event. like something I'd be very, very interested in. Say, um, not to break the subject here, but uh, where is the uh, uh, um, what you and your friend from Ohio, I believe he was, talking about the uh, conference? Yeah, that was Mark DeWorth from the Ohio Mark, Bigfoot and, Conference. And, and, and that's in May? Yeah, May 4th. It starts through the 6th. And where is it held? At the Salt Fork Lodge in the okay. northeastern corner right. of Ohio. Yep. Well, I'm going to be in May. I don't know what time I'll be there, but you do know that uh, your cousin Don lives just a few yes, miles. Yes, I do. Salt yeah, Fork they all live there. Yep. yep. So. Yeah, hopefully they so. can swing by and can say hi. And, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Don, uh, Don had an experience, uh, Doug, not that long ago. Oh, really? Yeah, you should call her and talk to her about it. Oh, uh, see, very, very. She was very adamant and very excited when she told told me about it, and she kept on asking me or asked me several times, "What did I see? What did I see?" I wasn't there, wow. but whatever it was, it, it, you know, uh, if you couldn't recognize it, it wasn't a man. Nope, it wasn't a man. She said it said. Uh, another type of animal, a bear standing up. So, no, it wasn't that. It was quite tall and it was black and it was off at a distance. Wow. The thing of it is, 
they took a double take at her. So she yeah, lived. She lives near Salt Fork somewhere, correct? Twenty miles from the main entrance gate to Salt Fork State oh, Park. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yep. the coincidences just keep on happening. They just keep on yep. happening. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. So. Yeah. I will but definitely double take at her. And, uh, well, look, look, look right at her. So yeah, give me her newest number, and I'll give her a call, and we'll get her on. I'll so, do that. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. Well, it's nine fifteen. We're out of time. Thank you, thank you. Oh, and Jim, thank you for becoming a new member. Awesome. Thank you, um, Charlotte too. She's been a member for nine months. Um, we will be getting out you guys some info on some private shows and some private webinars that we're going to be doing and that all the podcasters will be doing. So don't just be with us. You're going to have opportunities to join Jim Myers, to join um, uh, Chris Reinhardt, John Baranichok, all these different podcasters with one-on-ones. Um, and you can just, then you can really ask all you want, right? All the questions and just get to know them. You know, we want you to get to know our, our podcasters. So with that, Scott, thank you so much for coming on, telling all those really cool stories. We're going to get you back on again. I was, it's my, my pleasure to do something like this for you. Yeah, no, it was real honor to have you on. You're, you're an amazing guy and you were always my favorite cousin. Oh, thank you. You were far. So yeah, it was awesome. (laughs) And it's, um, it was just, uh, it was a fun show, Alex. Thank you for, all your technical help and all the stuff you do and everybody. And then tomorrow we have a full day of shooting. Actually, it's the first day of shooting for Legend Meets Science 2 here. First day of shooting here. Yeah. And we have four days of shooting here with witnesses that we're going to be regressing to see if we can get any new information. So it should be really interesting. And uh, more updates next, next week. We'll let, let everybody know how it went. All right. So with that, you, um, I always you, thank you. Yeah, but I always like to end it with just a tiny bit of wisdom. So, um, so you ready for my? Are you ready for my wisdom, yeah. Alex? Shoot, shoot! Well, I got to see if I have my wisdom on here. I don't just make this crap up. I mean, it's like I don't write it down. I don't even have it. I don't have it. I did it. I sent the wrong thing to myself. It was the last thing I did. I wrote up my my little. My little ditty for the for the good night. I screwed up. That's two screw ups I made this week. Everyone have a wonderful night. <laughs> yeah. Words from hey, Alex. Hey. All right. Good night. I want to hang up now. Good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Good night, Scott. Bye. Bye. Call you up in the middle of the night. Been bothered by dreams. Ain't feeling all right. You give me comfort, say just give it some time By the end of our talk, I'm feeling just fine You and I